That's it. Well, that thank you. Thank you, Zoom. Yes, thanks for reminding us. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, so, uh, which is great because this will be taped and it will be for use on YouTube. Um, so you can share it, you can view it afterward, etc. So uh, I encourage everybody to smile big for the camera. And uh, we always have a lot of folks that uh, do watch these events afterward. We want to say thank you to our sponsor, Bankers Trust. I see Rob is with us here today. Thank you so much, Rob, for sponsoring our West Des Moines Edge series. And what this series does is we look at key critical sectors that are vital to the West Des Moines region, vital to our citizens, our businesses. And today we're talking about education and this could not come more timely. I mean, so much is going on. DMAC, look at all that they went through these last couple of weeks. Talk about crazy. And then we've got the growth in West Des Moines of our innovation corridor, it's called. We were just reflecting about that backstage. So the innovation corridor, you're like, where is the innovation corridor, Catherine? Well, let me tell you. The Innovation Corridor is where DMAC West Campus resides right now, and they have been kind of lonely, but not for long, because Des Moines University is soon, uh, and they've already broken ground on their beautiful, stunning campus in that area. Of course, there is the RecPlex that is uh, already booming with events. The inside portion will be open pretty soon. There is so much going on in that area. So if you can imagine smart folks, young people in that area, this is going to be our educational hub, our innovation corridor hub. And I really predict this is going to be one of the vital, vital centers of our community. And I can imagine apartments, hotels, uh, entertainment, restaurants, retail. It is going to be filled with some of the best minds of our region because they will be attending DMAC and Des Moines University. So this is gonna be another city center. So isn't that incredible how many city centers West Des Moines has? How many uniquely beautiful, fabulous city centers? So. This is an incredible town. I'm so grateful to be here. My name is Katherine Harrington. I'm the proud president and CEO of the West Des Moines Chamber of Commerce. And today we have Dr. Brad Bach, Dr. Angela Franklin, Dr. Anthony Poshton, and Lane Mendenhall Bach talking about education and different portions that they all lead in this sector. So Today, keep your mics muted. Again, we will be taping. Bailey is our Zoom master and director for today's event. And I'm excited to introduce the West Des Moines Chamber team. So we have a new team member and most of you probably have already met him, but seven weeks on the job, Tom Florian, our director of membership and growth. Tom, wave your, wave your hand, excellent. Thank you, Tom, for being here. Anna Dowd is going to introduce our sponsor today. And we also have Nicole Langmaid here with us, yes. And Kara is behind the scenes getting ready for your term, so your turn social at Smash Park this afternoon. So she's waving virtually, I know, behind the scenes. So I'm excited to introduce Anna Dowd, who is gonna introduce our sponsor, Bankers Trust. And Anna is our Director of Membership and Strategic Partnerships. Thank you, Anna. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Catherine. It, it is great to see so many familiar faces today. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing our presenting sponsor, Bankers Trust, for our West Des Moines Edge events. Bankers Trust has been a longtime supporter of this program, previously when it was Business Roundtable. So we are grateful for the support they have given through this program's rebranding and just the overall support that Bankers Trust provides not only the chamber, but the entire West Des Moines community. So I'm excited to see we have Rob Reinhardt on the line with us today. So Rob, I can hand over the virtual mic if you'd like to say a few words. Yeah, I'll keep it very brief, um, but Anna and Catherine, thank you for allowing Bankers Trust to be a sponsor to bring these great ideas. I like the word innovation being brought into the conversation today even. I know it's not one of the title words, but I think it's uh, appropriate to bring that into today's discussion. Um, having known like Dr. Brad Buck for many years, it'll be interesting to hear some of his um, current works, not to mention plus when he was with the state of Iowa 
and how we can bring all that together. And we've got colleges represented as well, how we can bring innovation to raise the level of education in uh, this state to new highs. And uh, again, on behalf of Bankers Trust, I'm just thankful for the chamber for allowing us to participate. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you for being an incredible champion of the West Des Moines Chamber and of our region and supporting this effort. Um, we are really excited about shedding light on our key core sectors and education is what keeps our city ticking, right? We are known as having the best education in the nation. And we have some of the best educators here today. So I'm so excited. Each of our experts will have time to talk about what they're doing, advancements, innovation, change. And uh, I'm excited to turn the virtual podium to Dr. Brad Buck, who is also on the West Des Moines Chamber Board. So thank you, Dr. Buck. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Uh, and thanks for everybody for being on here. So I'm going to give you kind of a quick thumbnail. Hey, Rob, thanks for that uh, generous introduction and for you being a wonderful partner to Waukee Schools over the years. So uh, three kind of big ideas today. Uh, so what have we learned from a global pandemic as it relates to K-12 education and implementing it? Uh, where are we in our diversity, equity, and inclusion work? And how are we thinking and speaking about that? And then um, some work that we're engaged in related to what we think is innovative thinking about work-based learning and other ways to even better serve our students. So uh, if you'd be willing to go to that uh, next slide, please. So uh, I titled this Life Lessons from a Global Pandemic, which is just, uh, I'm not sure that it's fine. So there's two columns. Uh, one column is essentially sort of what we learned along the way and sort of where we're headed now coming out of the global pandemic. So just some things I would want to highlight. Um, one of the things we learned early on, so we're back now in March of 2020, and we quickly learned that our technology infrastructure wasn't what it was going to need to be to serve our kids uh, in a fully online environment. So we did a lot of work on wireless access for our families. And that's actually one of the things that we'll continue to do going forward. I, I see uh, K-12 education as a partner in helping families establish wireless access, uh, whether that's through low cost programming, hotspots, et cetera. Uh, one of the other things that emerged was device access. So even in families that um, the finances part potentially weren't a challenge for wireless access, trying to have three kids at home, mom and or dad at home, and all of them needing a device at the same time, put device pressure on homes uh, different from than what we might've expected. So we worked our way through that. Uh, and this is one of the things that's kind of amazing to me. We did not have a learning management system in place. So if you're familiar with uh, Blackboard or Moodle or those kind of tools where you can get your assignments, put chats together, those kinds of things, uh, we did not have a learning management system. So we were trying to quickly adapt to that. Uh, one of the things we were reminded of is uh, K-12 education is the fabric of society in many ways, or at least a portion of the fabric of society. So we were serving meals to families uh, on a pickup basis almost immediately throughout that pandemic. So um, that an important role in this society in terms of providing meals. Also, we're a connector in the community, social services and other things, and trying to keep our uh, role as a connector up and running uh, throughout the pandemic. And then one of the things I, and when I say this, we're recording, so I'm trying to hit the little man in my head, say, say this as nicely as you can. We are responsible for kids for a lot of hours of the day, and we do that to educate them. Uh, parents may have a different view of that at times in terms of a safe place for their child to be while they're working. So we were in a very interesting spot where parents were home because their employers wouldn't allow them to come to work. And at the same time, expecting all of our employees to be at work so their children could be uh, somewhere else. So I say that all in the most loving way. That was just sort of an interesting interplay between what's the role of K-12 education in uh, being a support to families who, who oftentimes have either a single parent working or both parents working outside the home. So that, that's been sort of an interesting dynamic. Um, we did come up with an online solution. So we actually had 10,000 of our students in person. We also run, were running a 2,000 student online solution. So uh, we learned a lot about what that uh, looks like. And, and I could go into great detail about any of these. I won't um, 
just try to be respectful of time. Um, good news is we did have some innovation that was ready. We had uh, high school programs that were already fully online or hybrid. So there was some of our course catalog that was uh, innovative ready, but a majority we just were learning on the fly. And uh, probably one of the most important things learned or reminded was when you're working in uh, uh, an environment where there's a high level of ambiguity, you're reminded that people have different thresholds for tolerance for ambiguity. Some people can adapt to change, pivot and grow quickly. Others that is terrifying for them and sort of all points in between. So when we're trying to navigate that, that was true of staff, that was true of families, that was true of students and trying to um, uh, seek grace and uh, and provide grace throughout. And then we always, you know, if you've ever seen the classic friends thing, the pivot uh, was, you know, part of our vernacular for a long while. Now we hardly ever say it because I don't know, that joke wears thin after enough pivoting, if, if you've experienced all that. Anyway, uh, one of the other things we learned, authentic, transparent communication, always a good thing. We did town halls. We had as many as 800 or 1,000 people on town halls at a time which was a really awesome uh, new sort of portion of our way to communicate uh, transparently with staff and families. And that likely wouldn't have been as successful as it was, except everybody was starting to use these types of tools. Uh, I honestly believe if before March of 2020, we'd have had a video town hall, the idea that we'd have gotten 800 to 1,000 people join that, I think would have been unlikely. Um, so this is actually one of the things that will carry forward and has been a really great tool for communication and um, connecting with our families and getting feedback. I mean, authentic two-way communication. So just a little bit about going forward. Uh, we did buy uh, iPads for all students in grades K through seven, MacBooks for eight, 12. So we got all this technology in their hands. Now we're going back and thinking about how do we optimize learning now that the kids have these tools. So. We always wanted these in kids' hands, but we'd have probably done more work with professional learning and support for staff ahead of it uh, had we not been in the circumstance we were in. But but staff, you know, they they took off and did well. I think we could probably do even better. Great reminder about youth wellness, so physical health of kids and mental health of kids. So kids have been stressed out in a number of ways through this, and we continue to work on. Uh, adding additional structures for mental health supports for our students. We actually have a grant application out there, fingers crossed, it would be about $700,000 worth of support to add some people whose full-time job is uh, continuing to build mental health infrastructure in our schools, social emotional learning activities, et cetera. Um, and then we're in a little bit of a weird spot now. We can't require masking, but our students who are in kindergarten through approximately sixth grade won't have access to vaccination till sometime, you know, most optimistically in the fall. So what are we gonna provide for kids and families in that circumstance until they can get access to the vaccination? So we're, uh, we're working through that right now. So that's a little bit about the pandemic sort of past and, and going forward. Uh, if you wanna do the next one, please, Bailey. So we, uh, we've been invested in diversity, equity and inclusion work. So before me, I'm in my second year on my second tour in Waukee schools. Um, and by the way, thanks for letting me talk about Waukee. I don't know if I said this to start. This is one of my favorite topics. I love this place. Um, and certainly our West Des Moines portion of it is, uh, it used to be the majority of our students were in West Des Moines. I think maybe we've passed the tipping point now in the other three, but it's, it's a significant number of our kids, obviously with West Des Moines addresses. Um, so about a year ago, we had some board approved uh, equity standards. So we're trying to provide a framework around our equity work, even though it's been going on for a number of years in a variety of ways. Uh, the four domains of those standards are identity, diversity, justice, and action. So you see those there. Uh, we were kind of chugging along and basically the concept is we build anchor lessons. So teachers get a set, uh, they use the standard they get an idea of what that lesson might look like and then any references or resources you might use to support the lesson. Um, we were chugging along with those and then you're probably familiar with where this conversation is headed. Uh, House file 802 was passed by the legislature. If you're not familiar with that, I would guess most are. Uh, it's sort of structured around, I don't know how to say this. Um, it's really, I think a direct, a direct conversation related to critical race theory, uh, 
some may say that's not what it's intended for, but um, we've also had uh, more of our parents coming in now and asking questions about why we have standards related to justice and action. Um, so uh, we are gonna continue with that work. I think though, uh, not just us, but all of us in, the, um, in these environments recognize the importance of the work and at the same time recognize there's a political climate out there that we all just need to be thoughtful about uh, how the work proceeds. Um, the other thing is oftentimes the conversation goes to race and uh, ethnicity conversations. Um, our LGBTQ community, so kids with uh, different gender, gender and sexual identities, they're, they're more likely to have a conversation with us about concerns about how they're being treated by peers or adults than race and ethnicity, for example. So the real conversation I think is around all in identities uh, and thinking about them, how they're important, how do we create a culture of belonging? You know, long, uh, long for a long time, the mantra in Waukee schools has been give love. I think we're trying to get some clarity around give love, a culture of belonging uh, and some of those things. So that's all certainly top of mind for us. Uh, we've made our uh, director of equity a full-time position and. And one of the conversations we've had a lot is how do we have our staff better represent the kids that are in front of them? So we have work underway with um, uh, recruitment um, and retention. Uh, that whole thing um, beyond the complexity of staff representation that looks like our kids, we're getting to a critical moment in K-12 education to even be able to hire. So I was on a call with superintendents yesterday there are some of our rural schools that are struggling to find elementary teachers. And I would tell you, there was a time in Waukee, we would get six to 800 applicants for our elementary jobs. That number is probably half that now, uh, or maybe even less in some of the outlying communities and smaller towns. Um, we're we're going to get to a critical point in the K-12 environment of are we even able to staff our schools and that's a whole nother thing sort of that's probably a whole nother hour long edge conversation anyway but that's that's a reality and then uh, also adding the additional sort of complexity of staff representation and I'm probably out of time so last one is this uh, just around the we always get the question on when there'll be a third high school. So we're opening a second high school this fall. So kind of tap the brakes on the third high school, but um, we have lots of work underway uh, at our innovation center in Apex, uh, 600 business partners. We intend to continue to grow that. Uh, one of the things we've talked about is, uh, could we expect every student to have a workplace learning experience by the time he or she graduates? So internship, job shadow, authentic project, apprenticeship, whatever those looks like. Uh, also looking at trying to back map to our comprehensive high schools to build capacity towards those work-based learning and other experiences. Um, even have a dream that we get back into our middle schools. So are the exploratories and electives we're offering in middle school, building capacity to get kids to high school, et cetera. Um, and then of course, uh, DMX great partner, uh, DMU has been a wonderful partner, an original partner uh, in the APEX. So uh, excited to hear what they have to say. And with that, I'm gonna tap out and get out of the way. This is great. I, Apex, love Apex. Maybe we start a West Des Moines Apex that's part of that innovation corridor. I don't know. You know, there could be ways that we collaborate and, and think of how to replicate that. And I know our our folks have, we just love that model. It's it's fabulous and what you guys are doing with Apex and STEM. And it's it's really, it's really amazing. So I love your DEI work, give love. That's so neat. And the town halls, very innovative. How many more are you thinking about doing those? Do you have those scheduled? Uh, we don't have a schedule for this year. We did them about uh, every other month. And one of the things I especially appreciated about them is we'd pick a topic and we would have people write all the questions they're thinking about relative to that topic. Then we'd, we'd cluster the answers so we could address those and then answered questions in real time. So it really was a way to educate the community at the same time we were listening to their uh, concerns. So we'll Fair. do them probably every other month coming up this school year. That's neat. That's neat. Well, you're the one that brought up critical race theory. And I told Lane Mendenhall Buck that we wouldn't talk about CRT. So, <laughs> but we're, we're not going to talk about that, but, but thank you for uh, at least bringing that up. So anyway, all right, we're excited to learn more about DMU and their stunning campus. We cannot wait. The anticipation is building Dr. Franklin. So we're so excited to pass the virtual baton to you. 
Okay, thank you, Catherine. And it's a pleasure to be on the panel with um, all the great um, educators um, in the area. Um, I just wanna acknowledge um, Dr. Buck made reference to DMU being an early partner with APEX. So we proudly were uh, one of the first groups of uh, entities that partnered with APEX. And even before there was that beautiful building out there in the Marquis, uh, we had those, those kids on our campus. So, so we continue to partner with them and are really proud to, to be a part of that program. So just um, an opportunity to talk a little bit about DMU. Um, the irony for us is that you know, we have been talking on campus here about opportunities to expand our approach. You know, we've been talking about dreaming big and being more innovative in our approach to teaching and learning. We are a health sciences institution, of course, been around since 1898. We started out as just a college of osteopathic medicine. Um, in those early years, you know, we were housed here downtown Des Moines. And the question was, well, what's next for us? And as I arrived 10 years ago as a, as a 15th president, those began the questions of what's next for this institution. And as things were evolving around the country in terms of the manner in which you teach, health sciences education, the question was, do we have the right facility and can we continue to grow? Um, being landlocked where we are, that be began some questions about what's next for us. The irony is that we ended up purchasing 88 acres of land in the innovation corridor. So we get to join you out there down the street from DMAC um, and in nearby Apex where we were already partnering, uh, all focus on building out this opportunity to continue to grow a platform for innovation with a real firm focus on careers in the health sciences. So those who may not be as familiar with Des Moines University, we have three colleges, uh, nine degree programs. You know, we were stuck with those nine degree programs here because we didn't have room to grow and expand. So now we can talk about what's new and the new opportunities uh, for the university as we start building out our space out in West Des Moines. So we're happy to, to be, be out there. Wanted to focus a few of my, converse, uh, my comments around our reaction and, and the impact of COVID on what we do here as a health sciences university. Uh, we have two online degree programs that just continue to move forward. Uh, our master's in public health and our master's in healthcare administration have always been online. So those programs just continue to move forward. But COVID and the pandemic had a real impact on our training of our health sciences students. So we initially had to pivot our curriculum. It disrupted everything that we do as it disrupted everyone else's um, way of teaching. But for us, what was most essential is the fact that our students, other than those online degree programs are mostly clinical. Um, so most of their training is in, in health, health um, care facilities. So the first effect for us was our students had to be removed from their training locations because the focus is on meeting the healthcare needs of those dealing with COVID. And then with proper protective gear, PPE, you know, that became another expense for us. So initially in March, 2020, when everything shut down, our students were removed from all of their clinical training sites, which was a real challenge for us. So how do you then get them properly trained uh, to meet the standards for boards and graduation? Um, accreditation bodies oversaw that process for us. Luckily for us, we were able to make the pivot um, to do more virtual online clinical experiences. Um, thanks to all of the new technologies around augmented virtual um, technology, even our anatomy lab, um, the instructions around those real hands-on lab experiences had to pivot to be more hybrid or more virtual. So by the summer last year, we started bringing back our students to small groups. So we had smaller group labs and those that went back into the clinics and the hospitals, we had to provide all the PPE because hospitals were no longer doing that. So there was the additional expense of getting them into those clinical settings safely. We were lucky that we were able to get everyone graduated on time last year and we were able to adjust our curriculum. So the biggest challenge for us was getting all of our faculty on board with this new way of delivering the curriculum. But it definitely has had the silver lining of informing the way we design our new campus. Whereas we've been talking about innovative approaches to teaching and learning, labs and new technologies evolving the curriculum. 
We were forced to because of the pandemic. Now we're designing our new teaching spaces based on what we've learned. So our new curriculum now is evolving. As we are bringing our students back this year, we're gonna keep some of those hybrid experiences with some virtual, some real in-person experiences. And for instance, our anatomy teaching is gonna be, if you look at an episode of CSI, bodies floating above tables, all this augmented virtual reality, we're actually doing that. And we're actually creating our new learning spaces in our new facilities based on these new technologies with spaces that can convert and evolve over time so that we don't have dated facilities that we have here. No longer students learning in big lecture halls anymore. And we have beautiful space here downtown Des Moines, but they're big dated auditoriums and they're mostly empty because students are more small group interactive kind of sessions where we do flip classrooms and they read the content and then they interact um, in person. So the new space we're designing out in West Des Moines will help facilitate the way that we do our teaching programs. Just a few other comments in terms of some of the best practices at, at DMU. Um, we're so proud that we were an early adopter of uh, diversity, equity, inclusivity in the manner in which we do our curriculum. Um, thanks to the leadership that comes from our chief diversity officer, Dr. Rich Salas, we began early on creating a diversity health series uh, that's now embedded in the curriculum. So some of the issues that we've been dealing with front um, of mine right now, given this very divisive year that we've just endured and all of the attention and focus on doing a better job of embracing difference and respecting difference. You know, we were an early adopter of having this incorporated in our teaching so that we not only train our future health providers in terms of the actual technical skills of being good physicians and clinicians, but we also bring along with them senses of issues around humility and, and cultural competence and, and respecting um, and valuing everyone and the difference that they bring because they will be providers um, and providing care to very changing, evolving demographic. So we proudly have incorporated all of that into our curriculum. We have programming around implicit bias. That's now a standard part of what we do at DMU. Um, so we're proud that we were early adopter. And one other best practice that we're getting some attention from most recently is the fact that medical school curriculum typically don't focus a lot on mental health training. Um, they have the basic courses in psychiatry, but what we found is a real opportunity for us was that not only do we prepare our graduates to understand and have an appreciation for mental illness and, and how to best meet the healthcare needs, regardless of whether you're going into psychiatry or not, any patient that needs that kind of care, that there's a real opportunity by partnering with NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, that we are the first and only medical school in the country that's adopted their provider training program. So that all of our students, regardless of what specialty that they choose, you know, have a real appreciation and understanding of what it means to treat the, the issues around middle, mental illness. And as team taught with family members and individuals dealing with, with a mental illness, um, as well as providers. So, so mental health, diversity, equity, inclusivity are part of the DNA um, of D DMU. And we're proud that we are out in front on that and setting some standards for how medical education can evolve to really focus more directly on incorporating those elements into the curriculum. On top of all the new technologies with new medical devices, opportunities for our students to learn in a space that will evolve over time. We're actually trying to design this space with the help of RDG architectural design firm to actually evolve with time. We don't want 50 years from now to say, oh, and now the space is dated, you know, or it now needs to be something different. We want our space to evolve with us, which is really kind of neat to be able to create from, from the ground up the health sciences university of the future uh, in an area that we have room to grow and room to expand. So I'm gonna stop and lend time to the next person to keep the conversation going, but thank you all for listening and being a part of the panel. Dr. Franklin, thank you so much. I think we 
I think I speak to everybody here. Augmented virtual technology sounds pretty neat. I would love to see what that looks like. I know when you mentioned CSI and, you know, I just imagine super futuristic kinds of things and how, how ironic that the pandemic really helped to kind of shape what you're thinking about as you know you are designing your new campus and and your new classrooms i think that's fascinating so you're right silver linings you never know where you're going to find them right even in the right. middle of the pandemic <laughs> that's, that's amazing that's incredible and dr richard salas is a rock star he's incredible we partner with dr salas a lot on so many different things so uh, he's just an incredible champion for dei and and you've got an incredible leader there and, you know, and I see two, uh, two similarities. So Dr. Brad Buck talked about physical mental health and the grant that, that he is applying for. And, and you also are partnering with NAMI for mental health training. So uh, maybe our other speakers too can talk a little bit about that. Obviously the pandemic brought mental health issues to light. We just did a panel uh, event uh, about that as well, not too long ago. So it's something that uh, I'm glad people are talking about. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Franklin. Again, your new campus can't come too soon. I just drove over there a couple of days ago to see where we're at. So I just can't wait to see it blossom and grow. So amazing. All right. Well, Dr. Poshton, we're so excited that you're here. Dr. Poshton has been on the West Des Moines Chamber Board for maybe you can tell me how many years when we met recently. You were you were saying many, many years. And, and thank you for helping to keep our chamber strong, Dr. Poshton. And uh, we're going to send the virtual podium over to you. So thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. And I don't have any groovy slides. And I don't have a great uh, CSI and health focus institution. In fact, when I talk about my campus, I, unlike all my colleagues here, I'm only talking about one part of the college I represent because DMAC, as we all know, is a very, very, very large institution. We cover, you know, 21 parts or all of 21 counties in Iowa. We have six campuses, uh, half a dozen learning centers. We service, you know, tens of thousands of students. I think the last count was 40, 50,000 students. It changes all the time. So, you know, we're a very large institution. So. I'm here to talk about my piece of it, which is the West Des Moines campus. And, and what's funny is I've got, I've, I've been doing this for so long. I've got history with all these institutions that are on the panel today. Like um, what's funny is uh, Dr. Buck, uh, during his first tenure at, at uh, Waukee, uh, both my kids went through Waukee schools. And I think I spent a couple of days in his office talking about my son um, on more than one occasion, um, which is ironic because he was the most, he was the most uh, un- his personality in high school and in, in middle school um, was so different than he is now because now he's a drill sergeant in the army. So you would have never guessed that when he back back when I was sitting in Brad's office. Um, you know, Dr. Franklin, I, I taught in the uh, health uh, services administration program for you guys for many many years prior to your um, taking over the, the, that role. Uh, and of course, West Des Moines schools. I've been working with them since we built the campus, and we built that campus, believe it or not, uh, over 20 years ago. Um, uh, I was hired to build a campus, so I can't have been around a long time. And we are celebrating our 20th fall term coming up here this fall. And um, before I, you know, I, I, I get into the, some of the history of the West Campus, I will say that uh, during the pandemic, you know, we were in a good position because, you know, DMAC, being as large as we were, we were already pretty, pretty well set up with the uh, IT infrastructure um, to provide online instruction. We were doing a lot of that already. Um, and we were doing a lot of web blended classes already. So all we had to do was pretty much pivot from web blended to virtual um, in, term, in terms of instruction. And um, we, we, we still offered labs, face-to-face uh, -face labs all during the pandemic, uh, whether it was you know, health related labs or whether it was biology or chemistry or physics or, or IT or, what, or, or, or all the CTE programs that we have, the career tech programs that we have and you know, in all the various um, disciplines. Those were all still offered, many, many of which face face all during the pandemic because there's no way to teach them this stuff online. Uh, but we were able to pivot pretty cleanly and smoothly. In fact, to be honest, we had less problems during the pandemic than we're having right now. Um, as Catherine mentioned, you know, we got we got hacked pretty bad um, a couple of weeks ago, and we've been digging out of that for the last two weeks. We are now seeing light you know, at the end of the tunnel. We our online classes were back up and running again. Our face-to-face, -face, we're back up and running about a week and a half ago, about a week ago. So we're back pretty much back above water. Uh, we're still treading water in certain areas, but uh, we're still back functional again now. And luckily, this happened during our summer term, which is our least busy term of the year. 
Uh, apparently, the hackers don't understand education, so they should have waited until fall to do this, I guess, um, when, we were, when we are at our busiest. But um, so luckily, for that, that, that was a bonus for us, I guess, if you, if you find some silver lining to all this. Uh, and we are, like I said, you know, we have dug out of this and we have um, kind of resurrected once again. Uh, so technology is great in some contexts, like the pandemic, and it can be bad at other times and make you wish for all face-to-face -face instruction and no IT whatsoever. Speaking of IT, so when we built the West Des Moines campus, uh, it was built from day one. And, you know, and, and like, and like uh, Dr. Franklin said, you know, who, you know, they're working with RDG. We also worked with RDG when we built West Des Moines campus at DMAC. And it was built from day one to be an IT technology innovation focused center. So when we first built the campus, all the programming was in the areas of um, computer hardware, uh, network hardware, software. Um, we, we had a lot of programming courses um, and coding cl and classes in various disciplines. Even going back to when we started, we, we were offering, believe it or not, COBOL still yeah, because of the whole Y2K aspect. And there's a lot of companies out there still demanding COBOL programmers. Uh, web development, uh, network technology, telecommunications, and e-commerce. And that was the bulk of our core programming. We were all tech-focused fo for the most part, and we offered liberal arts instruction as needed to support those programs, because all those programs have a he he heavy liberal arts component um, as part of them. Well, then, then the dot-com bubble burst, and for those of you who've been around long enough to know what that was, uh, or old enough to understand what that was, back about the turn of the millennium, we had... Uh, a lot of money was being dumped into dot-coms all around the world uh, by venture capitalists, et cetera. So most of these companies were artificially overvalued. And so when it came to the stock market, the all these dot-coms that were overvalued, the bubble burst, and they all tanked. I mean, there was a, a huge shrinkage, so to speak, of the, of the dot-com online company business model, like literally overnight. And of course, what that did was that it shifted the perception of the public away from IT temporarily. I can remember parents coming into my campus and sitting in my office with me with their, you know, with their children, their students, and, and telling me and telling their kids that IT is a dead end job. I mean, literally saying that to, to them. And this is, you know, about 20 years ago, back when, uh, you know, this all happened and we're all thinking, you know, IT is not going anywhere. It's going to keep growing, as a matter of fact, and, and, and becoming a bigger, a bigger and bigger impact in our lives. But the perception shifted and it was taboo all of a sudden because of what all just happened to their stock portfolios. So we had to pivot to use, you know, Dr. Buck's word, we had to pivot. And so we, we, we still offer a lot of the IT programming, but we also offered full liberal arts um, instruction as well. So we added the, in full, the, the, the full um, AA transfer degree so students could, could take their first two years on our campus and transfer to Iowa State, you know, Iowa, Drake, whatever. Um, and uh, we had to add a whole lot more curriculum all of a sudden to the campus that wasn't there. So I had to hire a lot of new faculty members rapidly all of a sudden. Um, we had to build out new labs, so we had to convert some, some instructional rooms to like biology labs, um, uh, physics labs, etc. So we were making all kinds of shifts, you know, over the course of these last 20 years, as per the market changes. Um, you know, the market's a funny thing when it comes to higher ed, because the market often dictates what you offer, because jobs change, careers change, uh, companies' needs change, and we have found that repeatedly over the years. But I will say one thing that we did do that was um, you know, kind of unique at the very beginning of the West Campus was unlike a lot of higher educational administrators, I was given pretty much a blank slate when I built West. And I was basically told I could do whatever I needed to do to do what I was supposed to do. And that was build a very future focused, very cutting edge IT um, uh, college campus, which is pretty unique in, in the higher ed world. So um, you know, I spent a year and a half, two years just planning this place. And luckily I got to hire all of my IT faculty members two years in advance. So we were doing basically a lot of development. So instead of teaching, my, 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 my faculty members were developers for the, first, for, for the very first two years. And during that time, we were doing things that were way ahead of the curve. Um, we got a lot of national press. We were the first college campus in the country that was all wireless. We were the first college campus in the country to be using handheld technology to deliver course content. Back then it was pocket PCs primarily because none of the Apple technology you know, that we take for granted today, the iPhone, the iPad, et cetera, existed. Um, and the only types of handheld technology back then were the pocket PCs and the um, uh, Palm Pilots. And Palm wasn't powerful enough, but the pocket PCs were. So Microsoft partnered with us and Compaq, which is now part of HP, 
um, and others partner with us to to deliver this this, this curriculum in, in a different way, uh, using using entirely different um, uh, pedagogy in terms of how we, how we approach it. Well, ironically, so because nobody would partner with us outside of the technology world, like for example, publishers wouldn't give us any content because of Napster. So again, again going back a ways here, but when people were, were ripping off music left and right. Uh, publishers were afraid to give us anything, so we had to develop our own. So all of our faculty members also had to write textbooks. Um, so we had content to deliver um, for, for the students. We had to write strip scripts and utilities to, to communicate wirelessly with these devices, uh, testing software, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we were way ahead of the curve. But then we opened as a campus, and I knew this was not sustainable, So it, and it wasn't. Uh, and, and besides that, what, what we learned early on was that Using technology in great ways is, 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 is awesome and is wonderful and it gets you a lot of press, et cetera, but it wasn't inspiring students. Uh, it wasn't inspiring students at all. Uh, in fact, it's causing more problems than anything else because it's all different and new. Uh, we realized that uh, our first job to get people to come down the IT road was to inspire them. And so we started thinking about environment and we started shifting our environment. So then we all of a sudden decided to show how the world they've all come to know and love and how they all take for granted every, every day um, has been the incremental improvements, innovations, um, cre creativity of a whole lot of people and how it's all been incremental over time. So we started thinking and wondering how we could, how we could share their story. So then we decided to turn the campus into an interactive you know, museum of innovation. So, um, about four or five years into the campus um, existence, we started building this out. So for those of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have not, um, we have a 20-year exhibit of the first 20 years of the development of the personal computer. It shows um, uh, how, uh, artifacts and graphics and so on and so forth. Every room is themed after a great American innovator. So, you know, and, and, we, and we take, and we, we, we did this back way before um, all the discussions of, uh, of diversity, you know, where, 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 where they are today. So all of our, we have built lots of diversity in our campus in terms of showing how ideas, great ideas can come from anybody, anywhere at any time. So every room is themed after a great American innovator. We have a uh, little video showing, you know, low five minute vid documentary videos playing about these people as you walk into the rooms, graphics, et cetera. We have a hundred year, 150 year exhibit of communications, how it's changed from the telegraph to the internet over time. Um, and we have you know, all kinds of things like that happening, but then we realized, well, that wasn't enough. So then we built our current CI live event, which basically has been now uh, coming up in our 13th year for this. We bring in about 15 speakers from all over the world. Um, many of which, if not most of which are famous in their own right for what they've done, but they're all great thinkers and they, and, 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 and they bring a real diverse opinion and, and diversity of background and experience to, to show our students and the general public, because it's all free to everybody, um, how, how great ideas come to be and to hopefully to inspire. And, that, and that's the whole purpose of this. Um, but what I'm finding, and what's kind of curious now uh, over time um, is as we continue to evolve the campus, uh, employers have kind of come back full circle again. So back when we opened the campus, the focus was primarily in the area of, of um, skills. It was all about skill sets and, and, and IT and technology focused skill sets. And we, we changed with the market changes. Well, now we're back. And what we have been finding for the last two years now is this, is this rapid shift back towards skill sets. And, and, and employers telling us every day they care a few, they, they're, they're caring less and less about degrees and more and more about skills to do the job. So again, we started rethinking about what we're offering, how we're offering it. And while we're still offering the full degrees, we're offering a lot more bite-sized training today in various areas, in the areas of web development, um, network technologies, uh, uh, animation. Now we're all, we, we, we have DMAX full animation program at West Campus. Uh, again, coding uh, in a variety of other areas to basically, you know, give employers, you know, people that they can bring in to do a job for them. Because again, this is all expanded so much now that it's all becoming so specialized and focused that they want them to do a thing for them, um, whether it be uh, a certain type of coding in a certain type of area or whether it's you know, animation in a certain type of development area online or a certain type of, of e-commerce development for, for the back end of a website or whatever, they want a specific task being done. So we're doing a lot more kind of one-off trainings now to help employers meet their employment, you know, the, the, the needs um, as they continue to shift. So we have, we have been kind of 
ebb and flowing for this last 20 years um, as the market shifted, and, and we're gonna, we will continue to do so. Um, uh, we were all we're always looking for new ways to do things. We're always looking for new ways to advance and, and move forward. So that's kind of West in our synopsis and 20 years of existence. Uh, so I will now defer to our wonderful partner communicate. I mean, um, uh, uh, community, our wonderful neighbor, uh, West Des Moines Community Schools. Thank you so much, Dr. Poshton. Really, really appreciate it. This this is so interesting. I learned so much. I didn't realize about the legacy and and all the evolving you've had to do and and uh, very interesting. We need to do a tour of your museum and bring other people there too because I don't know who has not seen that. That's really really cool. I haven't been to your campus for a while, so uh, I love it. And great ideas can come from anybody anywhere at any at any time. So DEI. And yep, great people, great minds. I love it. Woven into everything. Congrats on your 13th year of CI Live. That's amazing. So fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Poshin. All right, Lane Mendenhall Buck, West Des Moines Community School District. Love it. A full disclosure, my husband works for West Des Moines Community School District. He's a PBL science teacher at Valley High School and loves it. And it's just an incredible institution. So I'm excited to, to learn more from you and, and take it away, Lane. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. And th thanks for having me. I'm, I'm serving uh, on behalf of Dr. Lisa Ramey, who was unable to be here today. So glad I could, could jump in. So as you know, I'm, I guess, the last in this, and, and you'll probably hear a little bit of um, duplication because a lot of the things that were shared by uh, the three previous individuals are things that West Des Moines has addressed as well. Um, I want to give you a quick background on demographics, just in case you're not uh, familiar with those numbers with West Des Moines. We serve about 9,500 students pre-K through 12. We added preschool in all of our in all of our eight elementaries here in this last year, uh, and nearly half of them uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Will be a pivotal data point as we talk about the pandemic. And then the other uh, points of interest related to our English language learners, you know, just dozens and dozens of languages spoken in West Des Moines and the surrounding community, which is a really uh, strong enrichment focus, uh, not only within our district, but certainly to uh, all of the organizations represented here today. Uh, so in the past 15 months, what have we faced? How did we innovate and what will we do next? Those are the three things that I'm gonna focus on real briefly as it relates to both the pandemic and our conversations with equity. Uh, we joked that we felt like we were building a plane while flying the plane as it pertains to probably both of these, but primarily the pandemic. Uh, it was a fast moving 15 months for sure. And um, I'm gonna focus on a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts related to what the district handled. What did we address in the pandemic starting back in March of 2020? Uh, we realized pretty quickly that we did not have access from a technology standpoint, uh, primarily for our pre-K through two learners, but even uh, thinking about internet access. So as Dr. Buck mentioned, uh, we too had to address hotspots in partnerships with Mediacom and other ways that we could uh, make sure that our families had access to the internet. We even added some towers at our buildings. So um, in those early stages, people could uh, sit in their cars outside in the parking lot and, and gain access for the internet. Um, and then um, we also, our learning management system that we did have in place called Canvas was only uh, at the secondary level before uh, COVID. So we knew that we had to uh, really move fast in that in some of those changes and additionally with nutrition gosh families you know that they rely heavily on school districts not just for lunches but for breakfasts as well so we knew that that was something that we needed to address quickly moving at the speed of light i think we all can agree that things were changing so quickly uh not only just early on but throughout uh, the pandemic, not only from a medical standpoint, but also from uh, a legislative standpoint, political standpoint, things that came in. And so just being able to uh, keep our stakeholders informed 
And, um, and there was a need to have timely, transparent communication, which meant we communicated a lot more than we probably uh, wanted to. Not, uh, not that we wanted uh, to anyway not to be transparent, but gosh, they got to know my name a lot in the last year. And I'm sure every time they saw an email come in, they're like, not again. <laughs> so uh, things were moving quickly. Also on the health and safety side, uh, similar to what Dr. Buck and others have mentioned, you know, we had to figure out how are we going to educate our kids in buildings when social distance requirements were put in place. Uh, we knew that we had to think differently about um, HVAC and COVID tracing, and then really addressing at that educational side of things. We had families on both sides of this uh, topic related to their desire or lack of desire to have their children in a building learning and what would that look like so how can we safely teach in person and that was the work we did heavily in those first few months prior to school starting in august of 2020. from an equity lens i don't want to um, uh, overlook this because at the same time as we know in may of 2020 uh, with the george floyd uh, murder that there was not just local but national and international response. And while we had uh, equity work immersed in our buildings that had begun really uh, more uh, strategically in 2016, we needed uh, to prioritize that work and make sure that it did not get paused even though we were in the midst of a pandemic that they were um, equal in importance. So uh, that's what we faced. How did we innovate? We figured out how to get Chromebooks uh, to those pre-K through second grade students. And then we did drive-by pickups and um, partnered with uh, Microsoft and had other business partnerships and grants to get um, internet access and hotspots. We were able to get our teachers and our staff to um, innovate, to expand our Canvas learning management system to include our pre-K through six. And that work was done heavily over the summer as well as uh, providing professional development opportunities. We created a meal delivery system for those families who were very fearful of exiting their doors or could not because they were stuck at home working remotely and didn't um, have um, the ability to get out and pick up meals as well as providing uh, pickups at our buildings. And that has been ongoing throughout the school year we have a summer program that started pre-pandemic that is a, a bus that goes around to parks and apartment complexes for meal deliveries. And that happens um, both pre and, and post pandemic. And then uh, we just were thinking about how can we communicate differently? We had a great system with Blackboard for email, text, app and web. Um, and we continue to, to use those as well as integrating live streaming for board meetings, for graduations, for different events. Not only did that help us learn what was needed to, um, you know, how to, how to reach those audiences when they couldn't be in person, but gosh, we got great feedback from grandparents and those others who might be living far away that were able to see and experience events. Uh, and then we developed a pretty robust COVID dashboard that was updated daily that provided that transparent information on close contacts and positive cases, both at the staff and, uh, and student level. Health and safety, we had you know, face shields and masks and plexiglass, uh, updated HVAC for air quality control, had a cool new fogger we used that did cleaning that wrapped around surfaces, uh, had a, even a cool media story on that and a custodian that, that spoke really well on that topic. If you ever want to learn more, I can dig that up for you. Um, figured out how to COVID trace um, in a, you know, with all the other things that are going on and are, can't speak well enough about the nurses and, and the work that they did. And then provided vaccines to our employees uh, starting in February of this past year. From an educational standpoint and innovation, we, uh, we chose as a district to give our families choice, either 100% online or 100% in person. And 75% uh, chose in person for last school year, 25% online. That meant for our pre-K through six families that we had to develop pretty quickly cohorts of, of teachers who only taught 
online. So we would have a third grade class that could have students from all over the district, not just one building that now had new friends to meet and a new teacher potentially, where at the 712 levels, they remoted into their classrooms, but really just thinking differently of how we were teaching, leveraging our professional development or our professional learning communities, um, PLCs or what they're known of uh, inside the district. And those are just teaching communities that um, really thought uh, work together well to innovate and figure out how to adjust learning and um, you know connect with those kids when when sometimes teachers were teaching a child or a student online as well as in person at the same time. And then we really worked hard to add some professional development days to, to support staff. Um, at the equity level, um, we had a six point plan and I know I'm running short, so I'm not gonna go through all these, but we had a board approved six point plan last summer. We hired an equity directory with Dr. Anthony Ferguson and he's been doing great work this past school year. And so um, I'll speak real briefly to what we'll do next and hopefully get out of here. Uh, post pandemic, we're gonna continue to have Chromebooks be a, a normal part for all of our families. Digital citizenship is really um, creating grade specific Canvas modules uh, that will really help our students um, learn whether they um, hopefully are all back in the classroom, which is our plan for next year. But, um, but just understanding that there may be long-term online um, learning. Uh, and that's not necessarily because of the pandemic, but because of choice. And then health and safety, social and emotional learning is going to be a priority. Uh, we understand the impact of this past year on staff and students. And so we're prioritizing that with professional development as well as integrating that into our coursework uh, through the pre-K-12 level. Um, and then in addition to returning in person, uh, we're gonna figure out how to address those that unfinished learning uh, we've got some funds that uh, at the federal level, I, Dr. Buck probably has that same list of what are we going to do to help, um, you know, support potentially some gaps, uh, continued focus on our Iowa core, and then the partnerships of these individuals watching today with businesses, with DMAC, uh, that's where we can really give our students real world, real world experience, um, and then maybe a 22, 23 online school. So that was more than 10 minutes, I apologize. Um, but uh, you can learn more about our equity work. I'm gonna skip this part, but we, we're really excited about what's happening um, in the next school year. You can find it a lot more online. And uh, we really just plan to continue to innovate, but maybe not while flying the plane. <laughs> That's great. I love how you wrap that up. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lane. And Dr. Anthony Ferguson, he's active with the West Des Moines Chamber. He's part of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, a new committee that we started a year ago due, uh, due to the murder of George Floyd. And we have a lot of initiatives around that. So he's, he's amazing. So congratulations on all of your incredible work. Clearly, you've spelled that out beautifully. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here. This has been very enlightening, very informative. I have learned a lot today. I hope you did too. You know, West Des Moines is the sixth largest city in Iowa. And we have four counties that are part of West Des Moines, Polk, Dallas, Warren, and Madison. And we flank six school districts. So we are a very, very large community. We have 65 miles of trails and we cover 53.2 square miles and growing. So this is amazing. I want to thank everybody for being here. A couple of spotlights, upcoming events. We have so much going on. I hope you all subscribe to our newsletters. Those are free. Uh, simply go to our homepage and uh, a little box will pop up so you can subscribe. But we, we have our women mentoring event which is at the end of July and a brand new event, September one through our workforce division, Kara Matheson is leading the way with our brand new diversity, equity and inclusion workplace excellence awards. And that will honor workplaces and individuals in 11 award categories. So we are keeping the DEI momentum going. So we hope everybody can be part of that in a very special way. 
And Lane is on our Explore West Des Moines committee where we are doing our very first annual mega festival for West Des Moines called the Raccoon River Rally on October 2. Boz Prince is creating our logo now as, as we speak. Of course, he's in the beautiful Valley Junction area. So it's great for the family, kids. We're bringing tourists from all around the Midwest. So watch for more information on that. And that is presented by Google Fiber. So we're so excited you're here today. We wish everybody a wonderful, safe afternoon. And thank you for being part of the West Des Moines Chamber family. Thank you.